Let us read uh, the first eight verses. Amos chapter 7, uh, first eight verses. Let me begin at verse 1. Thus had the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting of the latter growth. And lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. And to pass that when they had made an end of eating the grass of the land, then I said, O Lord God, forgive, I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob arise, for he is small. Verse 3, the Lord repented for this, it shall not be, said the Lord. Said the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, the Lord God called to contend by fire, and it devoured the great deep, and did eat up a part. Verse 5, then said I, O Lord God, seize, I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob arise, for he is small. The Lord repented for this. This also shall not be, said the Lord God. Verse 7, Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass them by them any more. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you and praise you, Lord, for this time you gave us. Thank you, Lord. You're a gracious God, long-suffering, kind and gentle. Thank you, Lord, you granted us the privilege, Lord, to hear from you through your word. Lord, I pray that you will be present in our midst and speak uh, to all of us through me. I confess, Lord, I'm not worthy to handle your word or to stand on your behalf to speak to your people. But Lord, I pray that you intervene and speak to all of us. Grant to us, Lord, the word that we need, Lord, that we may be exhorted, edified, challenged, strengthened, inspired. Lord, that we, we, we may apply it to our daily lives to, to bring glory to you through our lives. Bless this time for us, Lord. For in Jesus' name I pray. Yeah, amen. Here we see uh, the first of the three, three visions in this uh, portion of scripture that we see. Ultimately, uh, Amos is going to get five visions. By the way, Amos, uh, later on in this uh, book, he confesses that he was not a prophet, neither the son of a prophet, was just a herdsman and a gatherer of the fruit of sycamore trees. You know, how humble he was, but also uh, his calling was such uh, that uh, he grew up uh, in the fields, in the agricultural world. He was not a great intellectual. Uh, like uh, Isaiah, for example, or the son of a prophet like Ezekiel, who had grand visions of uh, heavenly kingdoms, you know, the Christ God himself on the throne, but he was a down-to-earth man. And when God gave him visions accordingly, God used him in his capacity, and God wants to use us, all of us, in our capacities, and we should use the talents given to us you know, God gave five talents to, to one man, two talents to another, and only one talent. Whatever talents God gives us, we should, aspire, we should use those talents for the furtherance, for the building up of God's kingdom in our own capacity, and rather than aspiring to be someone we were not, you know, but doing the things faithfully, all that is entrusted to us, and God is honored in all that we do. First, we see here, that God gave three visions to Amos. Three visions. There will be five visions, and one of those visions is referred to in Acts 15th chapter. Uh, so that is uh, amazing uh, that Amos is referred to in the, Old Test in the New Testament. But the first three visions we see, first one is uh, that uh, God is going to send a judgment. First verse it says, The Lord God showed unto me, and behold, the f he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth. The latter growth corresponds to the crop, the real crop that comes. 
uh, apparently the the crops i'm not into agriculture as much but uh, some of you perhaps know uh, that a crop comes in two phases the early crop the first fruits and then the later crop which is the real crop so the king gets the first fruits that's, that's that's what it means after the king's mowings the king has gotten his due his share and then the real crop comes later and so god is saying i'm going to send grasshoppers uh, so all of it will be taken away apparently there's in the news that in africa there's going to be a massive grasshoppers coming up and it's going to be one of the worst apparently history has never seen anything like it uh, but grasshoppers is a, a plague is a, it's a devastation and destruction that you do not want to see and god is actually sending this as a judgment upon the nation of Israel. And here is Amos. When they had, uh, uh, it was in the vision, he was praying to God. And it says, when he saw the grasshoppers halfway through its destruction, he cried and said, oh God, forgive, I beseech thee. By whom shall Jacob arise, for he is small? He is interceding for the nation of Israel. One man interceding for the nation of Israel. God repented for this and said, It shall not be, he say, says the Lord. So Amos prayed and God said, Okay, I will not do it. For the sake of one man's prayer. You know, there's a, a book written by R.C. Sproul. I think, Does, does Prayer Change God? Artis probably is of the Calvinistic uh, persuasion. You know, it's like everything is ordained, predestined. And uh, he, and so it is an important question to ask how God, how prayer can change God. You know, God never uh, repents, right? He's never done anything wrong in the first place to repent. Uh, this is one of those mysteries that we do not understand, but it, we do understand that prayer works. Intercessory prayer works. God answers. And God answers sometimes in miraculous and mysterious ways. The God who answers by fire, as Jeremiah, as uh, uh, Elijah prayed, and God answered by fire. As uh, Midian prayed, God answered by prayer. So God answers. And here is an intercessor standing on behalf of a whole nation and crying and God relented and changed. And we see the same thing repeated again. God's second time was to destroy Jacob by fire. You see that in the next two verses. Uh, thus says the Lord showed unto me, this is this, uh, vision number two, and behold the Lord God called to contend by fire and it devoured the great deep and did eat up a part. This is all in the vision. Did not really come to pass in reality. As he saw that in the vision, he again cried to God, and God answered that prayer. And he withdrew that execution. And finally, the third vision, he says, O oh Lord God, uh, God showed to me, verse 7, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line. A plumb line. Well, this is the portion of scripture that I want to focus on. A plumb line. He showed me a plumb line. Now, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. A plumb line. And you see, Amos being uh, raised in the fields, in the agricultural fields, he understood exactly what that was. A plumb line uh, being used to work, construction, and so on. He understood very clearly. And he was able to explain the vision to the people of Israel. And this is a vision for which Amos never interceded to God for, because this is going to be a judgment that will not be withdrawn. The first two were against, directly against Israel, 
but the next one is against the king and also to take the nation of Israel as captives and that is part of the next uh, portion of scripture but here Amos understood that there is a plumb line God standing near a wall that is made by a plumb line and then saying that he will not forgive at uh, this time what Israel is doing. Now we just want to take uh, this uh, plumb line, what it is and what is its purpose and what is its use. Uh, jo Charles Spurgeon actually has an outline. I just took a portion of that where he says the, the plumb line is used for three things. One is plumb line is used in construction. Now plumb line, I don't know if you go to Home Depot, do you find a plumb line? No. You find a plumb line? You can't see a plumb line. Okay. It is not obsolete yet. <laughs> the Word of God is not obsolete, right? <laughs> it is still always fresh. <laughs> so the plumb line is used for construction. Use the plumb line to see how vertical something is. You want to build things vertically, right? If you don't build it vertically, after some time, they will collapse. Because the gravity is such that it will pull it vertically downwards. If there's something in, at an incline, at an angle, the force of gravity will act on it in such a way that ultimately it will collapse. So you need to vertical walls when you build things. So a plumb line is used to build vertical things vertically. Secondly, a plumb line is used to check whether something is vertical or not. And thirdly, a plumb line is used during destruction. It seems when you demolish something, for example, they'll say you're building, Navin built an extension to his house. He had actually had to, sorry Navin, I'm using you for illustration. So you see, there is a, a wall you want to demolish and you use a plumb line to say, okay, up to this point, uh, you need to demolish this portion of the wall you need to demolish. So that is when you use the plumb line, three purposes. You check it for, use it for construction, uh, check it against, uh, check it for the uh, finished uh, products, finished uh, construction. Uh, any wall that is finished you want to check. If you want to repair something you want to check. Thirdly, you, for destruction you use that. And God is standing by a wall that is built using a plumb line. So that is a vertical wall. God is standing by it and there is something very important about that. But uh, you see God always uses plumb line. God when he constructs, it is always accurate. Perfect. Uh, there is no blemish in what God does. Always perfect. The physical world, the physical universe that you see is perfect. There is nothing imperfect about what God does. Uh, at the physical level, you see how the, the planets are moving beautifully, circular motions. How the laws that he designed, devised, they are so perfect. It is uh, amazing, it is fascinating. Newton's square law says uh, the, the force of attraction is to the power of two, not 2.0001, 1.999, it is exactly two. And people were fascinated by it to see how it is so perfect. You know, how the, the mass of the sun, if it was just slightly above its limit, it would have destroyed all the planets around it. You know, how perfectly it is tuned, uh, how the DNA, how beautiful it is, the helix of the DNA, how marvelous it is, how so much information is compressed into that little cell in the human genome, and how uh, symmetry is in the world, how beautiful, how wonderful the symmetry is. It's uh, breathtaking to see the wonders that God has made God always makes things perfectly. He has done all things well. You know, that is talked about Jesus. Jesus has done all things well. The creator of the universe never makes anything imperfect, always perfect. But it is also true in the spiritual world. In the spiritual world, also, it is true. When God uh, builds using a plumb line in the spiritual realm also, he does something very similar. When, uh, 
God sees somebody imperfect. He does not try to build on that imperfection, right? He actually destroys the imperfect and then he builds on it from scratch. When a, a person is born again, he's a new creature. You know, we see that, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. All things have become new. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, right? It says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So he builds from scratch. He removes the old and he builds the new one. And uh, God is the one who gives the faith. He's the one who actually starts from scratch and fills, builds it up. Remember the rich young ruler? The rich young ruler, he came to Jesus and said, Master, what must I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? And then Jesus said, uh, you remember the Ten Commandments? And then you say yes, and then he gave those. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, honor thy father and thy mother, up to the Ninth Commandment. You know, the number five to number nine, Jesus uh, gave. And then he said, yes, I have followed them from my youth up. What do I still lack? And then Jesus said, go and sell all that you have. Come and follow me. And then he was sad and he went away. That is the point. Jesus was not saying that in order for you to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must become an ascetic, forsake everything you have, and then try to follow Christ as a beggar. Uh, no, that's not what he was saying. He was saying, he left out the 10th commandment because the 10th commandment says, thou shalt not covet. You shall not have such a desire for things of this world uh, that you are attached to them so tightly that they are your idols. That is your idol. You are attached to it. The covetousness and greed of a wealth has taken over you. It's consuming you and you need to get rid of that. And then he realized it and he said, okay, that is my idol. That is my God. I cannot follow the true God because I have this God to follow. And so he went away. Then when God who wants to begin that work in you, he ha you have to get rid of that other God. You have to get rid of, demolish uh, the edifice, that little temple that you have built uh, for that little thing that you adore and cherish. That has to be destroyed then God can build you up from scratch. It says in Hebrews 12 verse 1, look unto Jesus, the author of our faith. He is the beginner of our faith. He is the one we look up to. You know, when he begins that faith in us, he gives us a true repentance. He gives us that true repentance. Without that repentance, we really do not have uh, the changed heart. Now the change of heart, uh, the new heart, uh, the new life comes when we go through this repentance. When a man tries to convert a fellow being, you know, using their gimmicks, their clever tricks, uh, you find that it does not amount to much. I've really heard, uh, I've heard this uh, very recently, I was listening on the radio, and man of God, one preacher was talking, and he was saying, look, this is uh, uh, how you evangelize. And he talked about how you can uh, talk to people to lead them to Christ. You tell them, Have you, are you born again? And they would most sometimes, if they are not truly children of God, they will tell you they are not. And then you tell them, look, you say this prayer, and then you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. He said, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? I said, yes, I believe. Said, can God tell a lie? No, God cannot tell a lie. God says, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. It says very clearly. So, do you think that God is a liar? No, right? God is not a liar. So, you are saved. What are you thinking? You are saved. Right now, right this day, as your birthday, spiritual birthday, you are now saved. You are on your way to heaven. Believe in the eternal salvation. You are never going to hell. You know, the clever tricks that uh, people play. If you don't have the faith uh, that has resulted, that is a result of true repentance, you are on your way to hell. You are not on your way to heaven. 
It says in Romans uh, 6 chapter 20 and 21, he's talking to the Romans who are actually called to be saints, believers. There he's saying, for when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. He here is saying, Romans, you fellow saints, you were once living in sin, but now you are ashamed of those things. You feel ashamed of your past life. You know, that is a true mark of conversion. In 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 says, the Godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. You know, there's a godly sorrow that works towards uh, salvation. And that uh, sorrow is the repentance. You know, repentance and faith are inseparable twins, Matthew Henry said. Repentance and faith are inseparable twins. So the true salvation comes as a result of repentance. Matthew 3rd chapter, verse 1 to 3, I am actually reading from a paraphrase from uh, Kenneth Wiest. Kenneth Wiest actually wrote an expanded edition of the New Testament, translated directly from the Greek. And so he says, now in those days, there uh, makes his public appearance, John the baptizer, making a public proclamation with that formality, gravity and authority which must be listened to and obeyed. You see what he's saying. John the Baptist had so much gravity and authority when people listened to him they realized there's something very powerful about what John the Baptist is saying and that power filled with the Holy Spirit he says be having a change of mind which issues in regret and a change of conduct you now that is a, a repentance a change of conduct a regret for past life and a change of conduct for the future life and that is the true process of salvation. A lot of times uh, many you know, practical Christianity a lot of times people say you need to be practical you, you cannot say that you will be holy you give it your best if you can't it's all right God is not going to hold you to it no one is perfect you see you know that's the kind of uh, false teaching that we see these days. But God is teaching us to be holy. We see that in our memory verse, right? First Peter, first chapter, 13, 14, and 15. We have that. It says, uh, uh, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind and hope to be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children not fashioning yourselves according to your former lusts and your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy because I am holy. You know, the easy gospel is uh, that we give it a best shot and if it doesn't happen, it's okay. God is not a policeman to hold you to it. Uh, it is true that we do not attain perfection on this side of heaven. It is true uh, that none of us will attain to such a height that we will say, I am holy. There is nothing wrong in me, no sin in me. If we have that other verse, right? First John, first chapter, verse 10. If we say that we have no sin, we make God a liar. So we cannot reach that point. Yes, it is true. But because God has ordered us to be holy, we must strive to attain holy life. Now God actually lays that foundation which gives us that uh, desire to be watchful, to be prayerful, to be, care to be careful, to avoid sin. Now that is the kind of faith that God gives to us. If uh, the foundation that we have is not uh, towards leading us towards holiness, leading us towards a gracious walk uh, the, to, towards God, to attain the glory of God, to seek the glory of God. 
we have to remember that it is not the work of God. It is not the true work of God. If uh, there is any doctrine that uh, ins uh, incites in us uh, craving for sin or a licentious lifestyle, you know, you have a license to sin, you know, that's a licentious lifestyle. We, we do not have license to sin. I always quote my uncle who condemns or false the Christian lifestyle, Christian doctrine, to say that you Christians are, you have it so easy. It's actually worse than some of the heathen religions, worse than Hindu religion. At least the Hindus go to uh, pilgrimages, they go to yatras and uh, what are those, uh, you know, they dip themselves in rivers. Uh, some of those rituals that they go through, at least they're better than you. They go and take a dip in the river Ganges for the forgiveness of their sins. But you can commit any sin you want and then you go to God and pray and God will forgive you. And then you can live any kind of life, right? You know, that's the accusation that uh, unbelievers can accuse us of. If it is not the, the truth. The truth is far from it. God has made us such that the desire to commit sin is, is uh, removed. But it's true, sometimes we do fall into sin unintentionally as a sheep falls into the ditch, into a sewer. It is true, the, it, uh, but it's, uh, a sheep is so different from a pig. Pig wallows in the mud, wallows in the sewer. Uh, not so with a, with a sheep. A uh, sheep can fall into sin, immediately realizes that it is sinful, it is wrong, it's the wrong place, and then immediately try to correct, to change. God actually, when he begins that work in us, he brings it to perfection. Philippians first chapter, verse six it says, uh, so I forgot the, <laughs> I drew a blank, blank there, it says, he who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ, of Christ, yes. He who began a good work in you will perform it until the last. What he begins at the beginning, he will finish. We see that uh, Philippians 1, 6, right? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Naveen. Yes. He will perform it until the very end. And we have that in Hebrews 12, chapter, verse 2 also. Looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter, finisher of our faith. Yes. He will perform it until the very end. He has not built, he has not made us such that as we complete our journey, as we go to heaven, we do not take sin along with us. You know, is it like a defeated sinful lifestyle? No, no, no. It says in Ephesians 5th chapter, verse 26, I think it says, that uh, he sanctifies and cleanses the church with the washing of water, which is the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And that is how it will be. Yes, that absolute perfection, absolute holiness and sanctity and purity does come at the very end, yes, but working towards it, yes. We are all, by the work of God, are working towards that. So what God works in us, we also work uh, on our own. What God works in us, we also apply it. You know what uh, it says in Philippians 2nd chapter, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 2nd chapter 13, I think. Philippians 2nd chapter verse 13. Uh, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, 12, yes. For my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Yes, so we actually have to use the plumb line that God is uh, giving us to work out what God has worked in. We use a plumb line. First of all, to see whether we are truly born again, we must understand whether we are truly born again. Except you be born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God, right? And it, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And we're using the scriptures, 
applying the test to see whether we are truly born again. And I think Navin talked about once about the characteristics of the children of God, the characteristics of the children of God, how we develop a new hunger and thirst for God's word, how we are interested in the company of the children of God, how we love to be in the prayer meetings, how we desire to live a life that is pleasing to God. You know, all the tests that are given here, the fruits of the Spirit, how it is we test ourselves using the scriptures to understand whether we are truly born again. Also, it is important to realize that uh, the faith life, sometimes it, is, it, is, it has to be steady. The growth has to be steady. It cannot be dramatic. It, it can be dramatic, yes. A U-turn, sometimes we see that dramatic U-turn. Uh, but uh, some people claim to have become children of God in a very quick progression. They very quickly become leaders in the church. They're given a lot of responsibility. Uh, we really wonder sometimes, is there, is there really that uh, maturity and growth in that person uh, to be a leader, you know? I remember once I met uh, somebody who retired, who was a retired uh, civil servant, you know, that is, uh, is worked in the foreign services, Indian foreign services. He was uh, an ambassador to the country. And one of those uh, assignments he, he met with uh, an evangelist, and he apparently became a child of God. And as soon as he came home, they realized he was a, was a big man. He's become a Christian. And so some Christian organization made him a leader. And then he was sent out on a mission to preach. And he was here in our, in our midst once I was talking to him. He was talking to me, and he was telling me, you see, I am a new believer. They told me to be a conference speaker here in this place. I don't know how to, what to preach. He was uh, so in a difficult situation. The, he was given so much responsibility, so quickly, without realizing the maturity of that person. So we really need to, to use the scripture to understand whether we are where we need to be, examine ourselves, use the plumb line to understand where we are. Now, many times it is uh, possible that we think something is looking straight until we put the plumb line. You see, many times it looks very straight. Yes, it looks very straight. And you put the plumb line and you find that it is not really straight. It looks crooked. You see, in Revelation 3.17, Jesus is talking to this church and he says, you think you are, 3 verse 17, Revelation 3 verse 17 says, I have seen you and you think you are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Revelation 3 verse 17. But you don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. It is possible that uh, we think we have made it, we've got it, we got it under control and don't realize uh, that we are woefully inadequate in what we are doing. Fall short of the requirements that God has for us. So we need to examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith. Second Corinthians 13 verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Approve your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. You know, you need to examine. We need to examine ourselves. Very periodically we need to examine ourselves. Put the plumb line to see where we are, to understand. Uh, I think it was uh, Socrates who said an unexamined life is not worth living. Unexamined life is not worth living. Yes, it is. Uh, and I think it is uh, Thomas, uh, one of the Puritans, he said, uh, a faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. A faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. It's an important point that we need to test a faith to see where we are spiritually. Also, uh, this may be for those who are just starting out, those who are uh, trying to understand. When they're born into a church, for example, uh, parents are going to that church, and so you began your spiritual journey as a child of God, you need to examine the church. 
to see where the church is, see the church statement of faith, and see the practices of the church, and see how they value the word of God, how important is the word of God in the church. Is it the final authority? Is it given ultimate importance? Or do they have something else with it? We need to see the practices in the church. To see where it is according to the plumb line. Use a plumb line to understand where they are. I remember the very beginning when we were here in the US. I was away from home. Somebody came and knocked on our doors and, and then uh, Akka was there, Raji was there at home. They gave the tracts and everything and they talked to, yes, we believe in Jesus Christ. And then they said, look, but there's something more. And then they gave the tracts. Then when I came home and then I looked at her, I said, she was talking to me. They looked, they, they dressed in white and they looked very nice, very courteous, uh, seemed like true believers. They believe in Jesus Christ. <sighs> but then they want us to read this. And I looked at that and that was a tract from the Mormons. And then I realized this is a, a church of later day saints. They, yes, they do have the Bible, but they also have the Book of Mormons. They use the Book of Mormons as a superior uh, to the, the Bible. You see, if you have uh, such a thing in a church where the Word of God is secondary, what is primary is uh, the writings of. Uh, uh, this, uh, what's his name, uh, Joseph Smith, yes. Joseph Smith's writing is much more important because a later day saint is given more revelation and so that takes precedence over the word of God. So violating the, the, the doctrine of scripture. If any man adds to the scripture, the plagues that are written in this book shall be added to him. See that they are completely violating. So if there is anything that supersedes the word of God, uh, that is a place uh, that you don't want to be. You know, this Bible Missions Church is another example where this man is a super human being, uh, the founder of that uh, church. You see, where, what is more important? Is Christ the ultimate authority? The word of Christ ultimate authority or not? We need to understand that. And the, the methods that are used, I remember this uh, one man of God was saying, this OM, Operation Mobilization, is actually a trick, it seems. And many Hindus may say, the, oh, that is OM, that is some, so let's go and see what it is. So they're attracting people by deception. Uh, attraction, uh, we don't need to use uh, the devil's tricks uh, for God's work. You know, that may be an extreme example. I don't want to a fault that man who actually founded Operation Mobilization, but just the method used. We don't need to use faulty methods, deceptive means to attract people to God. Uh, so we need to apply the, the plumb line, the Word of God. A truthful, sincere means are they used in the, word of, in the church. Observe, find out where it is in the, when you apply the plumb line. The word of God is the plumb line, ultimate authority. Also, we need to apply the plumb line when we build the work of God. When we build upon, when we evangelize, when we uh, build the church, uh, we need to examine ourselves to see where we are. And this is a beautiful a beautiful portion of scripture in 1 Corinthians 3rd chapter. In fact, the entire chapter is talking about it. At least the first 15 verses. Apostle Paul talking to the Corinthian church and he's saying, I, brethren, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. But as unto carnal, as unto babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For wherein, whereas there is among you every envying and strifing and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Apostle Paul talking to the church in Corinth and saying, You people, you have envy. 
you have divisions, uh, you fight with each other, you're babes in Christ, you're not there. You talk about, uh, oh, Paulos is my hero, oh, Paul is my hero. You are talking, you're giving authority to men, you're giving yourselves to men, how foolish is it? Don't you realize I have planted, Apollos watered, but it is God who gave the increase. So neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that gives the increase. And here is the important part. He says, now that he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are laborers together with God. We are laborers together with God. And according to the grace that is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. As a wise master builder, I have used the plumb line to build a foundation. And using the same plumb line, uh, my fellow worker, Apollos, has built upon it. From the foundation, maybe there's a wall upon top of it. But the plumb line that God uses, he finds it. He sees whether that, that is vertical or not. God is the one who is going to judge it. He's going to use the plumb line to see how it is. My work, as well as Apollo's work, will be tested by this plumb line. And if it actually, the plumb line here is, is actually fire. God sends fire and then tests it. If it is solid, it will remain. But if it is wood, hay, and stubble, it will burn away. God is going to test every man's work. So we have to build the work that we build as co-laborers with God. The work that we do has to stand the test of fire. So we need to build it carefully. Use the plumb line to verify that it is according to the standard. You could be building something. When God comes, it may all be destroyed by fire. You may be saved just as if by fire, as if you're running away from a fire. You know, the fire is, the house is on fire. You're trying to run away, and you just escape by the skin of your teeth. You know, just barely escape. And that may be the lot of some of us who have not examined to see whether we are building it according to code, according to the standard, using the plumb line. Secondly, I just want to go to the next point that uh, the plumb line is used to test. Uh, so we actually try to test uh, the faith of others. For example, we don't, of course, try to be judges of others' faith. Of course, God is the ultimate judge. But we need to understand. Many times we need to discern. Uh, the, in that sense, we need to uh, play the part of a judge. And in Romans, in Matthew 7, chapter, it says, Judge not that ye be not judged, for, what, for with what judgment you judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure you use, it shall be measured against you. That is true. So we actually try to find fault with everyone that we come across. We will be actually severely judged. But uh, Jesus also said in the same chapter that we need to find out the fruit of certain people. And because if we don't, we may be misled. You see, it's uh, in the context of saying uh, that uh, there will be uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, and that's why we need to understand. He says in Matthew 7, chapter, verse uh, 15 onwards, he says there uh, that uh, uh, beware of false preachers. Prophets, yes. Come to you yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks, so. Yes. And you shall know them by their fruits. That is a test that we should always apply. Always apply the test of fruits. What kind of fruits are they bearing? Do they have the fruits of the Holy Spirit? Do they have that fruit? By their fruits, ye shall know them. 
we need to test it. All the time we need to test to understand where they are. Many times we find people who come to you with the pharisaical attitude, you know, legalistic. Sometimes people may be legalistic in their teaching, in their doctrine. You know, it says very clearly, by the deeds of the law shall no man be justified in his sight. So when you're, somebody is trying to be legalistic, you try to understand that it's going to be a difficult proposition all the time trying to be legalistic. We are saved by grace, not by the law. You know, many times uh, people are uh, trying to be ritualistic as well. A lot of times people are ritualistic. You know, they try to do many things, a lot of things, but they miss the point. Like uh, in Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, chapter, verse 22, uh, he was confronting Saul and saying, look, you missed the point. You're trying to offer sacrifices. Don't you know that to obey is better than sacrifice? In verse 22, Samuel says, Has God great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken, and then, and, and to hearken the, than the fat of rams. You know, basically he's saying you have to obey the commands God is giving you instead of following through with the, uh, the rituals. Uh, rituals don't matter. Uh, you know, I am trying to, <laughs> to complete uh, the three points that I was, uh, I was trying to get, or get through. But it is important that we use the plumb line uh, to see deceptive doctrines that there may be. You know, a lot of times people attend uh, prayer meetings, revival meetings, uh, conferences, all of that without any real change, without real action on their part. You know, we have that memory verse, James 1st chapter, verse 22. It says, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You know, that, uh, if you go back to the verses previ previous to that verse, you see how important it is uh, to, uh, the, the previous verses you have to an analyze and understand. It may be a good Bible study to, to go through that part, uh, but it is uh, much more important to obey uh, than to mark your attendance in all these events. But there's also another one that uh, God will take us through uh, to test us, to try us, to help us to grow. Uh, many times we might think that we have done well and Charles Spurgeon says, I thought I had so many things. Many of the things that I thought I had are going to pass the test of fire. And I saw God put one by one, one by one, he put in the fire. And I realized all of those are burnt up. There was no solid gold. I thought I had it. And I found out that I needed to grow much more. You know, to grow in patience, to, love, to grow in love, to grow in self-control. Uh, to grow in love of the brothers in, in so many of those things sometimes it requires a lot of time and a lot of uh, examination and, and growing in the Lord. So let me just come to the last point. I just went through the two points. One is using the plumb line. God uses the plumb line uh, in the term, in point of construction. How God actually does the work in us. Perfect work. And then how we apply that to our own selves, use the plumb line for our own selves, and then to use the plumb line for others in the church and other people, just to make sure that the doctrine is not deceptive. And thirdly, uh, we come to the point of how the plumb line being used is for destruction, how it is used for destruction. You know, it says in Ezekiel, it says, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. You know, we have that, right? 38, 15? I forget exactly where it is. In, the, in Ezekiel, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Second Peter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, but is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come 
to repentance. God is long suffering. When he, before he executes judgment, he gives a long time. The plumb line used for destruction comes very slowly. Very slowly. God gives enough time for everyone to understand and to see the consequences of the life that will be after at the time of destruction. Remember the, the story of Methuselah? Methuselah? It says in Strong's number, if you look at it, Methuselah means man of dart. But uh, some Hebrew scholars looked at that and said, it may be that we lost the original words uh, that actually meant something different. And they, uh, they uh, dissect it properly to the root words to say that it could also mean that after his death, it will come. After his death will come uh, the flood. Uh, that's a blank. Of course, that is, the flood is not in his name. After, the, after his death shall come. That's what it should mean. And if you look at the, the years that Methuselah lived, the longest, 969 years, that is how long God waited before he brought the flood. So long. Long suffering. God wants to give second chance, third chance, fourth chance, how many chances God gives before he brings destruction. He is not slack concerning his promise, but is long suffering to us word. It says in Revelation 20th chapter 11 and 12, it says, And I saw a great white throne on him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The final judgment. When people who do not believe in Christ will be sent to hell and will face eternal destruction forever. How will it be when we stand there and God says, stand in the balance to see where you stand. It's like Daniel 5.27. It's uh, the, the, the vision came to Belteshazzar. Belteshazzar, right? Um, Belshazzar, right? It says, thou have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Will it be the statement given to uh, those who who did not quite make it. Uh, he ignored all the, the, the warnings given to them. And the time has come to stand in the balance, tested to where we stand. Or are we like Job? He said, let me be weighed in an even balance, that God may know my integrity, he says in Job 31 verse 6. Of course, he was self-righteous at that point, but he came to the humility that God brought him to. Then he said, I repent in dust and ashes. Oh, woe unto me, I am undone. And I repent in dust and ashes, he says in Job 40th chapter. But can we say, like Job, I have integrity. I have trusted in Christ. I cannot claim to be anybody great, but I trust in Christ. You know, like uh, John Newton said, I cannot, I am not what I want to be. I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I will be. I am not what I hope to be. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. It says in 1 Corinthians 15th chapter, Apostle Paul says, I am the least of all the apostles because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Are we able to trust in Christ? To say that, yes, I can stand the final test. I can stand the final test because I am in Christ. You know, that plumb line uh, that actually uh, destroys at the very end. Uh, we need to be ready for that. If you trusted in Christ, obviously, we are all there. But there may be some of us here. There may be those of us who have not made it sure, making a calling and election sure. 
to make our calling and election sure is very important. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your grace and for your mercies, for all that you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, for granting us, Lord, your word. Lord, help us, Lord, to apply the plumb line, Lord, on a daily basis, Lord, to understand where we are. Lord, to grow in grace and in your knowledge, Lord, that we may bring glory and honor to you through our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.